What's going on, Nation? Sly here, and thanks again for coming back and checking out another Sly Nation breakdown. Well, looks like IGN has dropped more news this week, and on top of that 13-minute intro a few days ago, today we get a first-ever look at Inside the Nexus. Now, you can say what you want about their gaming skills, but they got it when it comes to knowing what people want to see. Now, I was just thinking to myself this morning about why we haven't really seen anything Inside the Nexus. I mean, we haven't seen that much at all besides a few clips in one of the briefing trailers, and then, bam! This pops up. So, plans have changed today, and instead of finishing off my briefing breakdown, we're going to take a look at this and see what we can learn when we slow things down. So, before we begin, sorry about not dropping a few of these videos on time, guys. YouTube isn't a full-time thing for me yet, so juggling life, work, and staying on point with vids is pretty damn tough. So, anything you all could do to help make that transition would be greatly appreciated. Sharing these videos helps me out tremendously, and anything else gets me one step closer to doing this full-time. Also, props go out to IGN for their coverage of Mass Effect. Their link is in the description box below, as well as the link to the original video, which I always recommend you guys should watch by itself, uninterrupted, before watching a breakdown. So, definitely check that out. Alright, enough talk, let's jump in, shall we? So, we start off here with a docking scene, and it looks to be like the center of the Nexus. It's pretty much inspired by the Presidium on the Citadel. It has a fake blue sky and water running through its center followed by tons of green grass. You know, it brings a sense of home into an unfamiliar place. Next, we find ourselves in the cultural center where a couple of Angara are learning about the different races of the Milky Way. And as you can see right here, they lay it on pretty thick. Due to our lifespan, sometimes reaching 1,000 years of age, we are patient in our decisions and prefer long-term solutions over short-term gains. Next, we get a first ever look at the tech labs aboard the Nexus, and here is our first ever look at the Blueprints and Augmentations terminal. Blueprints and Augmentations unlock by scanning technology in the field, but you can also buy them by acquiring R&D, which stands for research data. And the more you scan unknown objects, the more you can acquire research data, something we've been over before. Now with R&D points, you can then buy what you cannot find. And from what we've seen so far, it looks like blueprints can be a variety of different things, from weapons and armor to melee weapons and augmentations. Now the difference is that augmentations are upgrades that allow weapons and armor the ability to add something to it that's not normally found in its everyday normal function. It basically changes their abilities. The R&D terminal screen is split into research and then development. Research allows you to go in and unlock new blueprints and augments while development actually goes in and crafts the things you've discovered or unlocked. Alright, so something cool about this scene right here is that we finally get to see another currency. Now we've known about research data for quite some time now, but we finally have a symbol for it. It's the small Andromeda Initiative logo, as I always called them AI coins, but we now have a proper name. You can notice the different types of currencies here from this menu, which was taken from another video. So it's nice to be able to slowly identify each type. Alright, moving along here, research is broken down into three sections. There's weapons, armor, and then augmentations. Now one thing I noticed while reading all of those media reviews was that the crafting system is much, much larger than before. Borderline confusing for some due to its, you know, sheer size and amount of possible upgrades. And you know guys, I'm actually fine with that. Things need time to figure out. Which is another clue that this isn't a game in which you can just run through in a few hours, especially if you wish to craft something worthwhile. Next up, let's take a look at development, and even though it doesn't really get shown here, things aren't simply dumped right into development, like everything isn't right in this one menu. They all have their own folder, I guess you could call them, so you can easily identify and craft the things you need. Weapons, armor, augments, they're all sitting here waiting to be fabricated. Again, we see the color system back into play here. For example, the first blueprint is bronze, or common blueprint, whereas the fifth one down is silver, meaning it's an uncommon. Just like the previous Mass Effect games, things are unlocked in succession, where you start with a level 1 in a certain item, and as you build upon that or find its you know, greater equivalent, you will have it increase in level. As you see here, these are mostly level 3 blueprints, which for example, offer 4% more shielding on top of what you already have with your current setup. So whatever you are gaining for building this blueprint will be shown here under the description. And as we venture lower, we see exactly what it will take to start to build these beasts. 
Now, last time we were introduced to a few of the elements present around the explorable planets, you know, platinum, element zero, cadmium, and so on. Well, here we get to add a few more to the list. On the very bottom right, we can see that armor upgrades take a material known as Omnigel canisters. And if you remember, Omnigel was taken out in Mass Effect 2 and 3. We only really heard about it in the lore, like, you know, Scission Omnigel converter. Here, however, it looks like it's made its way back into the picture. Now, I'm pretty sure we're not going to be slapping it on the Nomad to fix it, but in canister form, you know, it kind of makes sense. In any case, the Initiative Recon Arms 3 will require 10 Omnigel canisters, 65 beryllium, 30 fluorite, and then 10 titanium. So there are quite a few of these elements we need to find and collect in order to build some of these blueprints. Now, hopefully they are abundant. While I don't mind gathering resources from time to time, if I have to stop at a new place to simply dig up one unit of titanium and then stop somewhere else to pick up another one unit, that will quickly become aggravating. So I'm kind of, I wouldn't say nervous, but I'm kind of uh, curious to see how that progresses. Again, notice the scroll wheel to the far left. It's pretty small like the other menus we've seen, and that means there's a lot of options. And options? Options are always good. Alright, next we're going to move along here and take a look at the Augments menu. Now the one we see here is an Augment called Seeking Plasma System. And notice the description that you can only apply one Augment to a weapon during the development process. This particular effect changes the weapon's projectiles to Seeking Plasma Bolts. The others in this menu, starting at the top, are a Ricochet System, basically bouncing bullets. Then we have a Coolant Unit, Bio Converter, plasma charge systems, concentration module, and then battlefield assist module. Now, are these all weapon augments? You know, I can't answer that. I really don't know. But I think augments might be one category for all of them. Weapons, armor, and all of that. We'll have to wait and see. Next, we see the very popular augment that allows you to convert a weapon into an ME1-style armament. These will turn into weapons that use the overheat mechanic. You'll never run out of ammo, but you have to watch your temps constantly. It's called the Vintage Heat Sink, and it's a rare augmentation. The description states that this is a gun behavioral augmentation. You may apply one such augment to a gun during the development process. Now, to me, that's worded pretty carefully. It seems that even though we may only apply one augment of this during the development, Maybe they just mean this type, because this augment is labeled gun behavioral augmentation. Is it possible that there might be, I don't know, three or four other different types of weapon augments that we can put one augment into each? I don't know, but this to me makes it sound possible. In any event, the list has a bunch of cool upgrades as well. Aerial stabilizers, electrical conduits, equilibrium regulator, grenade launcher, sticky grenade launcher, and then rebalanced field coils. Notice we're at the end of the scroll bar, so this is within the same menu we've seen in the previous shot. Now before we head out of this area, take a look at the very top where it says Milky Way Technology. Notice how there are two other menus that we can look through? Now I don't recognize those symbols, but it could be Remnant Technology and also Helios Cluster Technology. So there could be two more full menus of different augmentation technology. So that might also mean that there could be three different types of research data to acquire. Now notice the symbols at the very top of this picture. They are the exact same ones that I've shown you in this image here. Since we now know that that small AI logo is indeed research data from Milky Way Galaxy Tech, to me it makes sense that the other symbols here are research data for other technologies. Also, they're on the scanner, the same tool we use to collect research data. Now this is just something that I noticed and it's not been confirmed by any of the devs yet, but I think we are indeed right on the money. Now, going back to this image, if those two other menus are indeed just that, other menus full of different augmentation technology, then the reviews were absolutely right, and the possibilities seem to be just about endless as to what you can create. Next, we jump into our catalog of frozen homies. Now, we've seen the cryopod menus before, but this time, we get a little deeper look at what kind of perks we can unlock. This is the AVP area, where it takes a certain amount of Andromeda viability points to unlock certain perks. Now, to my knowledge, AVP is not a new type of currency. It's simply a level system, basically, or a gauge as to how many you have acquired. And then, at certain thresholds, you'll be able to unlock different areas in succession, rank 1, then rank 2, 3, etc., this menu shows the science pods, and at the top we have lab technicians, mining operations, improved development, 
expanded field analysis, which as you see to the right, deals with our forward stations. They are equipped with an array of probes, drills, and sensors so that the automated systems can detect mineral resources even over distances. This seems like it will open up to the discovery of more mining nodes, allowing easier access. After that, we have Accelerated Research, gives you a large team of experienced researchers which can complete projects with greater speed and efficiency. This reduces the amount of time it takes to earn research points. Following that is Improved Development. This reduces redundancies and improves effectiveness. It further increases research data gain from all sources by an additional 10%. And then finally, Innovation brings up the rear. Now the premise is that the more viable these golden worlds are, the more you make them, the more frozen homies can be unlocked and sent to these new colonies. And because more mines can do more work, they in turn create or allow these upgrades. So only by making worlds viable will you be able to acquire these upgrades. And moving along here, we finally get a peek at the military pods. Starts off with munitions hunting parties, special forces, and then reconnaissance, in which Nexus engineers attach long-range sensors and monitoring systems to forward stations. This allows us to see hidden caches close to our forward stations. Now, unfortunately, that's all we get here, but the rest are advanced training, always prepared, versatility, apex tactics one and two, and then ears to the ground. Now, what these accomplish are anyone's guess, but I am excited to see what we can keep improving on. All right, moving this bad boy along, we come to a common area within the Nexus, and here we see a glimpse, also some reassurance that this is indeed a Mass Effect game. Now, based on your decision's planet side, people aboard the Nexus will treat you accordingly, and if you're not doing a decent enough job, expect them to tell you about it, which is what Mass Effect, you know, is really built around, cause and effect situations. Free our families. As we continue our tour into the operations area within the Nexus, we see our first look at the main characters within the Nexus, the ones we were shown in the Nexus briefing trailer a few months ago. First up is Foster Addison, colonization lead. Then we have a look at our first female Krogan since Mass Effect 3, Knockmore Kesh, who heads up Nexus security. If they can trade us materials that'll help fix the Nexus, I'm good with it. And then finally, we meet Kandros, who is the lead-in for multiplayer and military operations known as Militia HQ. This is our point of contact for the single-player slash multiplayer tie-in known as Strike Team Missions. I wish we had a little more hands-on with this guy as well as a little more information, but for right now, this is all we get. We are promised, though, that we'll see more of this guy in the future and more info is to come. Anyway, welcome to Militia HQ. Excuse the mess. This office fields militia work, Nexus security, and looking for the Tyrion Ark. Also, squeezed in between frames here, we get a really fast glimpse at the elevator that takes you from the docked Ark to the Nexus or to the other side of the Nexus. Now, in the IGN trailer, Destin goes on to say that this is on board the Hyperion, the human Ark, and this elevator is what takes you there. Now, I can believe that the Pathfinder's quarters are aboard, but he also goes on to say that Sam's aboard the Ark, and I thought Sam was supposed to be on the Nexus, so not sure what that's about. Maybe I misunderstood it, or perhaps maybe it's just a node of Sam, or a server for this particular ship. But I thought once the Ark was docked, everyone would be boarding the Nexus to stay in a sort of, you know, living complex until planet viability. But turns out you can hop back onto the Ark and check out your father's quarters, which, by the way, has an awesome surprise for Mass Effect fans. Looks like Liara Tassoni now has a reach all the way into the Andromeda Galaxy. When studying a dead race, the most obvious problem is the lack of an observable population. So that was pretty cool, right? As we progress, this is the part I was talking about a little bit ago. Now you can stop by and check out Sam, but I thought Sam was on the Nexus. In any event, it's cool to know that you can willingly engage Sam. Now, I'm willing to bet that this is how you dig into your past. Instead of, you know, random chats planet side with Sam, I think you're going to have to come back here to initiate those types of conversations. And next up, IGN tells us that the Vortex Lounge is close to the docking bays. But is that close to the Ark docking bays or the Tempest docking bays? Either way, we've seen Vortex before, but not in this detail. Turns out part of your crew hangs out here, and it looks to be way more interactive than previous clubs. Entertainment switches up on stage, and even the bartender has side quests for you. And coming to the end of the video, we get a look at the Nexus from inside the Tempest. Also, we see the area where the Tempest docks, which is actually on the ring itself. This view here shows the Nexus in a semi-complete state. The middle ring is finished, as well as the arc docking structures. On top of that, the other arm has started to take shape. 
so it's definitely going to take some time to complete this. But the cool part of this view is that we finally get some numbers about just how big the Nexus truly is. On the right hand side in the description you can see that its length is about 15 and a half kilometers long. That's nine and a half miles of space station. Can you imagine the power it would take to make this thing jump to FTL speeds? I mean it is insane. Also the anchor wheel in the middle is 5.3 kilometers in diameter. So that means you roughly have like 17 kilometers if you were to walk around the entire wheel. That's almost 10 and a half miles of space station just inside the wheel. Now that is a truly enormous space station. Not as big as the Citadel, but think about it. This is organics that build this, not some machines. So that is definitely a huge step. But that brings us to a close, guys. This game just keeps getting freaking larger and larger. It looks like they really took the time to think stuff through and do that everywhere. I mean, if Mass Effect 1 could be recreated with today's engines and graphics, I think it would really, really closely resemble Andromeda. More meaningful things to do on a massive space station, way more planet exploration, meaningful side quests, and of course, lots of character building. But let's not forget the views. Now, every time I learn something new about Andromeda, I can't help but be excited for the 21st. Every time I completed a Mass Effect game for the first time back in the day, I was always sad to see it end. I didn't want it to end. I wanted the stories to continue. I wanted to build up more friendships. I wanted to keep exploring. Well, it looks like we're going to have all of that in spades. But that's it for me, guys. As always, thank you all so much for watching and for the support of my channel here. We just recently passed 14,000 subscribers, and that is effing fantastic, man. It's really an awesome feeling. I'm feeling a giveaway here very, very soon. So make sure you keep coming back and checking out more videos as I'll be formally announcing the giveaway here soon. I wanted to keep it for 15k, but I can't help myself. All right, well, as always, you can check me out on Twitter at Sly Nation or even on Facebook at Sly Nation Gaming. Always a pleasure to create videos in the universe that I absolutely love. And thank you guys for being a part of that. Keep an eye out for more videos coming out of Sly Nation here soon. But until then, this is your boy Sly, and I'll catch you all next time.